So how are plates normally designed? How do they, how do they fit? Well, what they do is uh, they go to uh, a bunch of saw bones, or in this case, a lot of people go to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and they take 100 uh, distal tibias and they do a CAT scan, and they throw out the highs and lows, they average the data, and that gives you this idealized, maybe the perfect ideal shape and contour, which actually works pretty nicely. Or if you don't want to go to Cleveland, uh, you do it on a computer. You do a, a finite element analysis based on saw bone measurements. You have an idealized contour of the bone, which then you get an idealized contour of, uh, of the plate. And that's okay. But there's really, in thinking about that, there's not a lot of science. There's no good reason why we do that other than that's what's always been done. I grew up in a very rural part of northern Wyoming and have been around uh, cows and lots of bones my entire life. And I guess maybe that's why I do what I do. But it's been kind of a hobby in terms of uh, finding skeletons and reassembling these, kind of a morbid hobby. But I got a lot of, a lot of skeletons in my closet, too. This is our, our pole barn. But these things are not uncommon. You find lots of uh, bones kind of out, out and about. And uh, even my daughter, when she was younger, was uh, totally into that. That's a, that's a coyote for those of you that uh, aren't familiar. So the one thing that I noticed in looking at all these bones is they do have consistent contours, similar morphology, whether it's a bobcat, a coyote, uh, a horse, a deer, a moose. Uh, the morphology is incredibly consistent, regardless of the species. This is a dinosaur bone that my, uh, my brother and I found out on our property. Same thing, it matches a contour identical to uh, a squirrel bone, right? So the contour, something is going on because it's incredibly consistent. So I'm not much of a math geek, but my daughters are, and uh, we were talking about this, and they happened to mention the Fibonacci equation, and so I started doing a little uh, interested uh, reading on this. He was an Italian mathematician, supposedly the most talented uh, uh, Western mathematician of the Middle Ages. And he came up with the Fibonacci numbers, the Fibonacci sequence, which is uh, very interesting. And it's very, very simple. Each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. And basically what that means is zero plus one is one, one plus one is two, two plus one is three, and so on and so on and so on. That's the Fibonacci sequence. Well, big deal. What, what, what does that mean? Well, if you take the ratio of those two successive numbers, in other words, 1, 1, and divide by each by the number before it, you'll find the following series of numbers. 1 divided by 1, 2 divided by 1, 3 divided by 2, 5 divided by 3. Essentially what happens is you come down to this ratio, and the farther out you go, uh, that ratio was very consistent, 1 to 1.6. 1.5388, it's kind of like pi, only it's phi. Except phi doesn't get a lot of public uh, press, but pi does. And probably phi should be more important than, than pi, I guess, all right? At any rate, not to belabor the point, but when you look at this golden ratio, it's very consistent. The farther out you go, it becomes right on 1.6 point blah, 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 blah. It's, it's incredibly consistent. Again, so big deal. Well, if you look at that ratio, 1 to 1.6, and you start forming triangles and arcs, you get what's called a golden rectangle, whose side lengths are the golden ratio, 1 to 1.6. And if you look at this ratio, here is 1, and this is 1.6, and you start drawing uh, tangent arcs to that, you're going to get a Fibonacci curve. All right, there's 1.6, there's 1, and then you draw an arc, and you connect the arc, you get these spirals, the Fibonacci spirals, and it's all based on the Fibonacci sequence and the pi, uh, the, 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 uh, the golden ratio. Right, there's one, there's one, 1.6, and you connect the dots and you get this perfect Fibonacci spiral. And again, big deal. So points on the spiral are, again, pi, excuse me, phi, 1.618 times as far from the center after a quarter turn, and as that spirals, as it spirals out, it's still consistent because the numbers get bigger, but the ratio is always the same. No matter what the number is, the ratio and the spiral is always the same. So you see this in seashells. You see this in prehistoric nautilus shells. Okay. Uh, again, here's the curve. Here's the curve when you graph that out. And what does that look like? That looks like, and I'll show you in just a minute, metaphyseal bone, the metaphyseal curve. 
And so looking at that it reminded me when I, when I saw this graphed out, it looks like a distal tibia or a proximal tibia metaphysis. We'll approach that in just a minute. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence applies in the way seeds develop, the way uh, trees and leaves uh, flower, the number of flowers is all a Fibonacci sequence. Uh, cauliflower, pine cone, it's amazing, it's all a Fibonacci sequence. Uh, the way the trees and leaves uh, in a daisy, uh, chain of daisies works, exactly the same. So, thinking about that, uh, since all these spirals are self-similar, they look the same no matter what the scale, you have to realize the scale doesn't matter. What matters is the proportion. The spirals all have a fixed proportion that determines their shape, but it's the same as the proportions generated by the Fibonacci sequence. So it's incredible. It's like a law of nature. For whatever reason, that's just the way it is. As I tell my residents, I don't follow the rules of biology. I don't make the rules of biology. I just have to follow them, right? It's just the way it is. So, interestingly enough, this is a Fibonacci spiral. Uh, what really freaked me out was this is a galaxy, a picture from the Hubble telescope. That's a Fibonacci spiral. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the physics of the uh, subatomic particles, they're all in a Fibonacci spiral. Hurricanes, Fibonacci spiral. And probably most importantly, Fibonacci <laughs> spiral. Maybe, maybe not. We won't get into that. But it's a perfect Fibonacci spiral. So. The scale doesn't matter, but what matters is the ideal proportion. And the ideal average contour, I'm going to tell you right now, is wrong. So the way that you get an average of the bone, that's not correct. It, it, it's just not, it's, it's not obeying the laws of nature, right? Uh, and uh, the early Renaissance artists actually discovered this. Uh, many artists and architects use that golden ratio because it's naturally aesthetically pleasing uh, and it's human perfection. And so if you analyze uh, 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 Mona Lisa and uh, Aphrodite's, it's all the Fibonacci ratio, okay? The Fibonacci code, in terms of the length of your arms and your legs, follows that precisely. It's not the Da Vinci code, that's, that's a, a different story. This is the Fibonacci code. Uh, and, it, and it holds true for the spiral in your, in your uh, fingerprints, spiral in your fist, the length of your arm, your ears, it's, it's again a universal law of nature. So you have two hands with five fingers, which has three parts separated by two knuckles. So that's a Fibonacci uh, a progression. If you measure the length of the bones in your finger, and so you do the Fibonacci uh, ratio, the middle bone is phi, right? So the ratio, the length of all these bones to your hand, to your finger, it's 1.16. So the Fibonacci uh, uh, golden rule applies in your hand, your wrist, the length of your forearm to your humerus, the length of your tibia to your femur to your pelvis. It's, it, it's, it's consistent. Uh, I wish I would have thought of this, but I didn't. Uh, someone way up there had it together because it's, it's totally consistent altogether, okay? So how do you combine that into a plate? Uh, well, I do a lot of frames. Uh, and a lot of deformity correction and you have you can't think in terms of two dimensions and a lot of plates are they're bent and they're curved it's two dimensional correction but actually in reality you have a six axis correction all bones have six axes that you have to correct varus valgus apex anterior posterior length and rotation most plates are designed on two of those axes it was our hope we can't really design based on length although you can but it was our, our goal to design on at least five of those six axes that you, tr that you have to correct and you have to pay attention to. Uh, as I said, most plates have two of those pretty well, even though the ratio is wrong, their contours are wrong, they do take into account two of the, ac two of the six axes that you need to, to pay attention to. And so all articular plates really are uh, uh, three axis corrections you have to pay attention to. So how do you do that? So now we start talking about how this, this progression applies to metaphyseal bone, what I call a metaphyseal curve. So I put these in a, in, in a light box because I wasn't really convinced that this would apply. And then you measure in a light box, you can measure, you can see the contours. There's the anterior contour, there's the medial contour. You rotate the bone around, you get a posterior contour. And you start to see where there's torsion. There's actually a back bend to all of these. The bone isn't straight, it actually is a little bit apex anterior and there's torsion. So each bone, in addition to the Fibonacci progression, has 
six contours that you have to pay attention to, hopefully pay attention to. So that was the genesis of things that we had to accomplish when designing the plate. Not only have the correct ratio and proportion, but the evaluation of the six axis uh, contour morphology. Okay? So if you draw lines like we're doing here, and, and you measure those, uh, what do you think we come up with? What's the ratio? That's what we've been talking about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's phi. This is a, a perfect Fibonacci progression. It's a Fibonacci spiral um, that you can overlay, and it matches uh, perfectly. No matter what contour you measure, it's all, it either goes up or goes down, but it's the same ratio no matter what contour you're looking at. Again, thinking about the Fibonacci spiral and laying that over metaphyseal bone, it's a metaphyseal curve. There's the curve when plotted out, all right? It matches exactly the metaphyseal of whether it's proximal tibia, distal tibia, it matches the femur, matches your little finger, and the ratios are exactly the same. So you can, you can counterlay that spiral much like we did with uh, President Trump's hair, matches perfectly. So that's the design rationale for the system. Okay, well that's great, so how do you actually take that from, from here to, to what you see now? Uh, so there's templates. You can get an idealized template taking into account uh, those curves, the six axis correction only. It's, it's length was something that you can decide on later. But you made a template for each contour, determine the golden ratio, which we already know, and then match the ratio of the contours designed, uh, excuse me, contour desired for each of the templates. And then it, what that tells you is the scale doesn't matter. The bone can be this big, can be this big. What matters is the proportion. As I've said all along, the proportion never changes. The proportion is constant. So you have to have to really dial in that proportion. That's what's the key. So no matter what the size, the variation, the size of the patient, the proportion is always, 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 by rule of law, is always the same. That's the Fibonacci equation, right? So it was a very, once we kind of knew that, and we had the templates, and we had the contour, then basically you could scale it up or scale it down. You could, you could vary the size because you knew the ratio, you knew the contour was fine, and then you could lay it, now you could do a finite element, you could lay it on an on idealized saw bone, and then we could start designing and putting in the little particulars. But what was key here, even this plate, you can see there's a little bit of a back bend that comes back and then it curves around. The width is, is, the, is the metaphyseal curve. Uh, the torsion here is the metaphyseal curve. You can see the torsion here. It's all based on, uh, on, the, on the Fibonacci spiral and the Fibonacci equation. So once you had that down, then it's a simple matter of just picking what you wanted to do. Do I want more screw holes here? Do I want less? Do I want it wider here? Do I want it smaller? I want to cut out because I want to get the, uh, I want to get the uh, syndesmotic screw here. Uh, we want more of a back bend. I mean, it, it, once you had the contour, then the rest was, was fairly idealized or fairly simplistic in terms of just on a computer. And I would get these drawings and I would mess around on my computer and, and overmark them uh, and so forth. So here's our, our idealized hook plate that allows you to, to not only uh, hook in comminution, but allows you to take uh, K wires and there's little uh, uh, slots where you can do tension banding. So you basically get uh, multiple areas of fixation using a hook plate, uh, K-wires, and then a tension band uh, fixating the entire montage. So this is our posterior plate. You can see I've marked up the idealized contour. Here's uh, the, 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 the screw holes that I wanted. I wanted a little bit broader here. I wanted cutouts for the syndesmotic screws. So there's too many holes here. I don't like that. So, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Here's the anterior uh, plates talking about the different screw configuration. But what never changed was the contour. Again, the proportion was always the same. The contour was always the same. It's just, you know, personal preference. I want a hole here, I want a hole there. Yeah, who cares? It's the contour that matters, right? And again, just kind of uh, going back and forth over the cutouts for the syndesmosis, narrowing this area, placing slots if you wanted to get a little uh, eccentric compression kind of the fine-tuning the stuff, and it's just a matter of picking the type of fixation patterns that you wanted. We'll talk a little bit about this because uh, this, was, this was my Houston suture passer that now was turned into an instrument, uh, which was uh, actually very nice. So anyway, that was the rationale, uh, the contour, and, and how we thought about the, uh, making the plates that actually, that actually fit. Again, with the wish list, I wanted uh, kind of a mini-frag system with uh, 
uh, contouring plates and T plates for these little position plates, cortical rim plates, hook plates, all in one set so that my uh, operating room staff wouldn't have to go scrounging around in the middle of the night. So here's kind of the final uh, uh, design change of the fibular hook plate, which allows multiple points of fixation with uh, tension band wiring or tension band suturing and tension band wires in, in addition to the uh, hook plate. As, and this is some early uh, prototype designs, but this is essentially how it can go and you can actually place suture through here. If you have a lot of comminution, it's very nice. You can, you can kind of gather all this up through a tension band type of a, of a uh, construct. Uh, the fibular fixation is a posterior lateral and a direct a lateral plate. Again, uh, the key here is the contour, and this is a five-axis correction. You can see there's torsion. Uh, there's a little bit of a back bend and a forward bend in all of these. Uh, it's not a straight plate, and it's not a flat plate. This is incredibly uh, 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 contoured very carefully, and I think that's why these actually fit pretty much. And they're not going to fit 100% of the time because of the variability of people but pretty much they're gonna fit 99.999% of the time. In addition to that, I wanted a set that had uh, all your ancillary clamps that you could use a king tong to compress the syndesmosis. All your types of fixation, you didn't have to go again for another tray, uh, go down the hall with your operative team. Screw, uh, screw number and type is very key. Uh, this is a, a really nice uh, headless compression screw. It's got differing pitch. So instead of using just a regular cancellous cannulated screw, partially threaded for a medium allelis, you can use these and you actually get uh, bifocal compression because the pitch is different. You actually get very good compression across the medium allelis. And the rest of, rest of these are fairly uh, standard screws, but locking and non-locking options in a, in a range of sizes. But, but this is, a, it doesn't look too uh, elegant, but it's an incredibly elegant uh, screw and really does a nice job. And I'll show a little demonstration of that. This is the uh, Houston suture passer that doubles as a periosteal elevator that you can tie a suture onto. It's a pylon, again, placing a medial, and you can do it laterally, too, that, that I showed earlier. Percutaneous plate, a little uh, articular incision to do the work. Uh, pass this down, bring it out through the distal wound. It's got, a it's got a suture onto it. The plates have uh, suture holes where you can attach a suture uh, to it. And then uh, there's, there's the suture we're going to uh, apply it to a to the plate and then uh, basically pull the plate directly underneath and it basically because it's along the trajectory the plate follows the bone and you might think that's well we just we can just push it up but in fact it's very difficult to do uh, if you've done it before without this type of technique the plate goes down it goes up very difficult to get it to stay or to go along the trajectory of the bone and so think about a wet noodle it's much easier to pull it than it is to push it. Pushing a wet noodle, it just goes wherever, and it's a real struggle. So it's much easier to pull that plate, just pull it right up, and it follows the contour perfectly, rather than grabbing it here. I mean, you can kind of help it, but some companies have an outrigger that, that grasps onto that, and you're pushing it, and it'll end up into the posterior compartment. It'll pop out through the skin. This is a much easier, uh, simplistic, and yet elegant way to do that. If you pull it up, it lies right along the bone because that's where your periosteal elevator went, so it can't go any other place than where your elevator was, correct? And then just fill in the holes uh, percutaneously. So this is the option of the uh, position and the small uh, contouring plates. Uh, that uh, There's quite a few, but uh, in my mind, that's, that's a good thing. And uh, this would be my idea of a cortical, uh, anterior cortical of a buttress plate. And you can see uh, uh, an anterior crush here, so you're going to have to buttress this from the front. And uh, a side view, um, again showing some uh, articular uh, compression again with this anterior cortical uh, uh, deficit. Uh, Reapproximating re the articular surface. Now, this is a nice, elegant tool. This is a, 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 a drill sleeve that actually clicks into the plate and doesn't come out. And so if you're doing a percutaneous fixation, uh, through minimal incisions, you can basically take a K-wire, find the hole, click this in, and then it's, it's fixed. It doesn't fall out. You, you, it's, there's no hands, uh, as I'll show you in a minute. It, it stays in, and it's in the trajectory of the, uh, of the locking screw. So it's a very nice, again, very simple, but very elegant little, little device. And uh, again, here we've, we've, we want to orient our screw this way, so it's clicked in. My hand is off of it, and it's given us the trajectory that we place the screw. 
Uh, these are these uh, little contouring plates to hold these very small periarticular cortical rim fragments. But again, just a, a, a nice design feature that you may not think about, but yet when you need it and, and you don't have to keep your hand on that, uh, on that drill sleeve, it's very nice and very elegant. And very simplistic uh, way to treat this, but very, very nice. More of a bimalleolar type construct. No real surprises here, fairly large uh, posterior malleolar uh, uh, fracture line, but really no, no uh, surprises. A uh, little, little bit of comminution on the medial mal, so uh, a pretty much standard plate. Notice that it, I'm not really doing anything, that pushing it with a freer elevator, and it looks like it's matched that contour pretty much with not even trying, just laying up against there. It fits, uh, of course it has to fit because that's, that's the law of nature, right? One K-wire, notice the contour here. It's pretty much anatomic with not, not doing anything, just laying it on. Uh, fixing that posterior mal percutaneously and then coming back with a little malleable uh, self-contouring con plate. Again, using our nice little elegant drill sleeves that, that don't fall out, that stay put. And uh, the, uh, this is a, about a, almost a year follow-up on this, uh, this uh, lady. A little more involved, again, the syndesmosis, you can see it may be an issue. A medial mal with some comminution. Again, uh, holding the plate, which fits uh, just, just, I have to say, perfectly syndesmotic screw and uh, multiple options distally for your distal fixation uh, and then using our kind of bifocal compression screw uh, which gives us nice bifocal and also a little gap here and uh, as we tighten it down the gap gets completely uh, incorporated and, and squeezed. I left this a little proud so that's my bad but you can actually these are designed to go underneath underneath the cortex so that you don't even feel them as opposed to a uh, a routine cancellous screw, which may leave the head a little bit proud, but these have an incredible uh, bite to them, as you see here. That, that fracture line is pretty much obliterated. So this is a system, uh, a whole host of, uh, it's a lot of plates, but it gives you options, and options are what you need in the heat of the battle at uh, midnight or eight o'clock in the morning. You wanna have everything at hand with the ready instrumentation. So just remember, if you take one thing home from this, the scale doesn't matter, what matters is the proportion, and the proportion is always, always the same, no matter whether it's a, a coyote, a horse, a squirrel, or, uh, or me, we're all the same. So uh, thank you, thank you very much.